strange. True happiness is short-lived and spontaneous. This or that happens in life happy stuff. A daughter's wedding for a dad. Dad's happy for his daughter. Cheering for her in bittersweet happiness. It's not a constant state. And no, I don't think we should chase happiness. Happiness happens. I love that, Darren. Um, Pleasure happens too. Chasing pleasure can sprout a journey into hedonism. Now that is something worth thinking about, Darren, because I think you've got it, that sometimes we can go on a hunting expedition and it actually leads us to feeling actually drained and um, like we're searching for things that are, are, are too, too difficult to pin down. Um, it can be exhausting um, and that uh, kind of chasing things that actually don't serve, you know, that hedonistic um, race, you know, the bigger this, the better that, and then only finding that, in fact, it doesn't really lead to happiness at all. Um, Darren also says the goal of recovery in my life is to radically accept reality in present moments. I wish to be happy when happy is natural, when sad sad when that is the moment angry real emotions i lost touch with all of them for years in moments when one is fully present lately that's about a sense of calm Um, and uh, darren who i've spoken to on a number of occasions says uh, dr anna points out calm neutral content i hold this motto close to the chest oh he's quoting joseph campbell wonderful find a place inside where there is joy the joy will burn off the pain Wow, really wise words. Thank you so much, Darren, for for adding that uh, to our discussion today. So that's that's beautiful. Now I also got another um, message as well, and uh, this was actually related to a conversation that I had um, last night when I was spending some time with some friends. And this is from Jackie, and Jackie says, happiness might might have something to do with leaving the world a better place than when you came into it. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all that this came from Jackie. She's a bright light and um, a beautiful person, so thank you for suggesting that. What do you think? Do you think happiness is having something to do with leaving the world a better place than when you came into it? Kind of uh, a really remarkable sentiment especially in in this day where you know maybe we put so much focus on the things that we might acquire to make us happy or the you know the great um, achievements we believe that we can accomplish you know as opposed to really recognizing that maybe we can feel good just by making a meaningful contribution and what happens when we really make a meaningful contribution you know what what's the impact on us is that happiness so uh just so we are all clear if you want to communicate with us today it's in studio 101 at gmail.com and i would love to hear from you i'm happy to speak with you Uh, i'd like to know your thoughts about this topic and you know how it strikes you you know the kinds of things that you realize about happiness and i would like to just play you this little short clip about Um, happiness it's just really a conversation that I had last night um, and it's just really off the cuff and kind of amusing because it's just very light-hearted and you know just what do you think about happiness okay so now I'm gonna ask you guys what what do you think happiness is being with your friends. Working dogs. <laughs> being with your friends. Yeah. yeah. I think so too, actually. Yeah. Being with people I really like. Yeah. Yeah. Company I really like. What? what? Do you like your friends? Oh, do I like my friends? I, I, yeah, I actually do. Yeah. 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 Laughing really hard that your stomach hurts and you can't. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that is and good. And you don't really know why you're laughing. Yeah, I love it. We've had those. Times. You just end up laughing. That's true. Yeah, that's yeah. like the best. Yeah. What about you? Palm trees. Palm trees. Okay. Oh, oh, you're thinking about your vacation. It's going in a yeah. couple okay. weeks. Yeah, okay. Going away. And my house is full of palm trees. <laughs> and your house is full of palm trees. What? Gold? Paying off your mortgage. <laughs> Paying off your mortgage. Oh, that made me really yeah. happy. Ooh. Ooh. Like, Ooh. how do you know it makes you happy? All these, no, 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 all these 
different girl. things yeah. that you're talking yeah, about. It was a goal. It was a goal, and I reached it. Oh, okay. But then, how do you know it makes you really like? But what is the actual experience of happy? That's the thing that oh, I your wonder about. Off. <laughs> oh, oh, getting your braces off. Oh, getting braces off. Getting braces off. That was yeah. so happy. Yeah. How do I know I'm happy? Oh, getting yeah, from the kitchen machine. That's we get a really good. Cool. Cool. <laughs> And, you know, as we went on in our conversation, it became really apparent that one of the things that everybody could really agree on was the feeling of connecting. You know, when you had a group of people around who you really trusted or you really enjoyed their company uh, or just had a sense of, you know, feeling free and uh, comfortable um, and that you can have an honest um, connection with them. However, you know, there are experts in this field who've been talking about this issue for a very long time, and I want to let uh, you hear a little bit from Robert Waldinger, who's been involved in one of the longest studies on happiness ever, and he talks about what makes a good life, and let's hear from Waldinger. healthy and happy as we go through life. If you were going to invest now in your future best self, where would you put your time and your energy? There was a recent survey of millennials asking them what their most important life goals were. And over 80% said that a major life goal for them was to get rich. And another 50% of those same young adults said that another major life goal was to become famous. <laughs> and we're constantly told to lean in to work, to push harder and achieve more. We're given the impression that these are the things that we need to go after in order to have a good life. Pictures of entire lives of the choices that people make and how those choices work out for them, those pictures are almost impossible to get. Most of what we know about human life, we know from asking people to remember the past. And as we know, hindsight is anything but 2020. We forget vast amounts of what happens to us in life. And sometimes memory is downright creative. But what if we could watch entire lives as they unfold through time? What if we could study people from the time that they were teenagers all the way into old age to see what really keeps people happy and healthy? We did that. The Harvard study of adult development may be 
the longest study of adult life that's ever been done. For 75 years, we've tracked the lives of 724 men. Year after year, asking about their work, their home lives, their health, and of course asking all along the way without knowing how their life stories were going to turn out. Studies like this are exceedingly rare. Almost all projects of this kind fall apart within a decade because too many people drop out of the study or funding for the research dries up or the researchers get distracted or they die and nobody moves the ball further down the field. But through a combination of luck and the persistence of several generations of researchers, this study has survived. About 60 of our original 724 men are still alive, still participating in the study, most of them in their 90s. And we are now beginning to study the more than 2,000 children of these men. And I'm the fourth director of the study. Since 1938, we've tracked the lives of two groups of men. The first group started in the study when they were sophomores at Harvard College. They all finished college during World War II, and then most went off to serve in the war. And the second group that we've followed was a group of boys from Boston's poorest neighborhoods. Boys who were chosen for the study specifically because they were from some of the most troubled and disadvantaged families in the Boston of the 1930s. Most lived in tenements many without hot and cold running water. When they entered the study, all of these teenagers were interviewed, they were given medical exams. We went to their homes and we interviewed their parents. And then these teenagers grew up into adults who entered all walks of life. They became factory workers and lawyers and bricklayers and doctors. One president of the United States some developed alcoholism, a few developed schizophrenia. Some climbed the social ladder from the bottom all the way to the very top, and some made that journey in the opposite direction. The founders of this study would never in their wildest dreams have imagined that I would be standing here today, 75 years later, telling you that the study still continues. Every two years, our patient and dedicated research staff calls up our men and asks them if we can send them yet one more set of questions about their lives. Many of the inner city Boston men ask us, why do you keep wanting to study me? My life just isn't that interesting. The Harvard men never ask that question. <laughs> get the clearest picture of these lives, we don't just send them questionnaires. We interview them in their living rooms. We get their medical records from their doctors. We draw their blood. We scan their brains. We talk to their children. We videotape them talking with their wives about their deepest concerns. And when about a decade ago, we finally asked the wives if they would join us as members of the study, many of the women said, you know, it's about time. So what have we learned? What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives? Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75 year study is this, good relationships keep us happier and healthier. Period. We've learned three big lessons about relationships. The first is that social connections are really good for us and that loneliness kills. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy 
their health declines earlier in midlife, their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. And the sad fact is that at any given time, more than one in five Americans will report that they're lonely. So this is huge. And, of course, the thing that it leads us to ask is, what what can we do to turn things around if we find that we're really not happy or we, we're, we're not as connected as we want or need to be? Well, there are some strategies, and these come from Lia Brumarski, who is a well-known researcher. Sonia has been doing research. She's actually worked in the area her entire career. So she's a psychologist, and she's done some studies, and what she recognizes there are five key strategies to increasing happiness, and here they are. So she has identified regularly setting aside time to recall moments of gratitude. You'll remember that I gave you a strategy for rehearsing the positive at the beginning of this radio show where I said one of the nicest things that we can do is really identify a moment. It can be very, very simple, something that, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of money or prestige in order to achieve something. It does, it's not a long-term goal that you have managed to make happen. It's just a moment in time. So regularly setting aside time to recall moments of gratitude, keeping a journal in which one counts one's blessings, or writing daily gratitude letters. Now, these don't have to be complex. I would just encourage you to do something very short. Um, you know, just have maybe a journal by your bed and, you know, take a moment when you wake up in the morning or when you go to sleep or both in which you identify moments that you can be grateful for and um, keep it simple. Uh, the next one is engaging in self-regulatory and positive thinking about oneself. So, you know, that, that's really about settling your own nervous system down and recognizing that there are things to, um, to say to yourself that are positive, like, you know, I'm, I'm deserving of some kindness. I'm worthy of good self-care. You know, those are simple things that really are, are good for you to be saying to yourself. So reflecting and walking, writing and talking about happiness um, and, and even, you know, times when you've been unhappy but that you're there supporting yourself that you can be loving towards yourself even when things don't go the way you had hoped them to go. And that becomes very important as well because how we see our failures, if we turn our failures into um, a, a kind of confirmation bias that, you know, well, if this bad thing happened, then this bad thing will happen everywhere in all times. Um, first of all, things like that, it's not necessarily true, um, but we don't want to use one example to kind of um, infect every other possible moment in our life. So it's more like, you know, receiving moments that may have worked out well and some that may not have worked out as well with some kindness towards ourselves and a willingness to be um, gracious toward ourselves, even when maybe we're, we're unhappy about a certain kind of outcome. The third um, practice that um, Laya Bermersky recommends is practicing altruism and kindness. So routinely committing acts of kindness um, or trying to make somebody you know or a loved one um, or even an anonymous person, uh, somebody you don't know, you know, do something kind for them. You know, um, you know, somebody's at the grocery store and, you know, they, they're trying to pay and, you know, all of a sudden they're missing, you know, a dollar. And, you know, you can just pull that dollar out and say, you know, this is on me. That's fine. Or, you know, some other minor way of doing something kind. Uh, four is affirming one's most important values. So what might that be? So do you, do you value... Um, animals? 
do you want to see animals treated well? You know, is there some way that you can include that as part of your life? Are you able to volunteer? Is there a shelter close by? You know, like, what is it that you know is important to you? Do you believe in your community? If you do, is there a community center that you can get involved with? You know, are there some community-based activities that are important to you? The fifth is savoring positive experiences. Okay, we keep on coming back to this one, and I think it's really important. Using one of the five senses, you relish daily moments or living in that particular moment. So let's say you saw something just gorgeous. Like when I was on my hike that I told you about earlier, I found myself in this beautiful setting. And there was a little bridge crossing uh, a river. And, well, it was more of a stream than a river, actually. But it was very sweet. And I, I took the time to sit down. And, you know, I have a picture in my mind of being there and just the, the lovely feeling that I get of remembering that moment. So, you know, these kinds of things can just be something that we use to, you know, very much infuse our lives with the feeling of that. Now, remember, one of the biggest things is connection. So finding different ways to connect is hugely, hugely important. And I have some ideas about that as well. I like putting together um, a, a, a plan. <laughs> I like plans because I find that if we have a plan, we can follow it. It just makes it a lot easier to manage. So I want to come up with a number of different activities that I'm willing to try out that will include other people in a community-based setting. And although I might have a strategy in mind or something I want to learn or an activity I want to be involved in, I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing engages me in a community-based setting. Now, I may find um, that I want to learn how to bowl. Uh, and, you know, I, I go to a local bowling place and I go there and, you know, I can join a club and, you know, attend on a weekly basis, and I know that it's going to involve other people. Well, I might go five or ten times, and if I find that after I've given it a good try, I like the activity, I can make more of a regular commitment to it. But the, the, the idea here is that more like your, your dating activities and that it's okay if it's not a good fit, uh, so I don't want you to make commitments to things that you feel are really not good for you uh, just to follow some kind of plan. This is more about figuring out where you fit and what's comfortable for you. So identify, you know, three or four different activities that you're willing to try in a community-based setting that allow you to engage um, in a way that has some social element to it. And then, you know, jump in. You know, th there's um, a really good website. It's, um, it's called meetup.com. And whatever community you're in, you can, you know, type in meetup.com or download the Meetup uh, app uh, and search for activities within your community within a certain radius of your neighborhood. Uh, and whatever it is, you know, maybe you want to join a hiking club or maybe you, you, you want to learn to meditate in a group or, you know, become a part of a discussion group about um, books. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The point is this is about you and it's about coming together in social community. Remember um, what we just heard uh, from Robert Waldinger is that really one of the most important things is being engaged with others in a meaningful way. So we have some emails that have just come in, and let's read through those too. Hi, Nan. Um, Nan says, exciting topic. I have many things that make me happy. Number one, golden retrievers. Oh, I'm, I'm on the same page with you, Nan. I just love animals. And I've got a big Bernie Doodle who is 110 pounds, and he is just beautiful to have around. Um, Nan also says, I love animals, especially dogs, friends, and coffee, and people that are considerate. And thank you, Nan, for uh, adding that. I'm going to ask you a question, Nan. I want you to help me to understand how you know those things make you happy. This is the question I was asking last night um, 
to a group of friends that I was speaking with, and uh, it was kind of a chaotic conversation, uh, but one of those, you know, just lighthearted moments where everybody has something to say, but I want you to just notice for a moment, what is the feeling inside of yourself when you connect to what you're calling a happy feeling? So that's what I'm really curious about. What do you know is happening inside of you? And just um, see if you can help me a little bit with that, okay? So thank you so much for that. Now this one is from Ken, and Ken says, family makes me happy. I guess that is, of course, if you get along with them, and I do, and spending time with them is life's joy for me. Love the radio show. Thank you, Ken. That's very kind of you. Um, see, that gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling inside and the, the sense of being connected in that really nice way with other people is something that I really relate to uh, as well. Um, thank you for giving us that piece of um, truth from you, Ken. I'm also going to ask you the same question as I asked Nan. Take a moment, get connected with a moment in time where you were with your family and you had that really nice feeling and just notice if you can being really quiet inside what's the inner experience of that what's the inner lived experience of that um, and if you can let us know that would be great as well because that's what I'm really trying to capture what is the inner lived experience of that happiness and thank you again. And here is another one. And um, this is from Ray. And Ray says, very beautiful topic today. I think happiness for all mankind is the reality of being nice to other people. Consideration, manners, and compassion are key. If these attributes were well used by all of us, we would, be, we would all be very happy. Well, Thank you for sharing that, and um, I, I think there's something really, really lovely about what you're raising, particularly here, this idea that there's something profoundly um, self-nourishing um, about being kind to others and being in community where, where that is a, a very appreciated and valued quality in our connections and what is it about the way we we live in our life today that that seems to have diminished so much where either people are in so much of a rush that they don't have the time for consideration or we don't value these things as much as we used to you know I think that's a, a really important thing you know when we start focusing on qualities that are no longer nourishing or don't really, you know, serve us, we notice that there's a real increase in feelings of depression and loneliness and disconnection and, you know, it seems to be leading to some real problems in terms of increase in um, mental health struggles, depression, anxiety, and stress. And we do know that for sure, if, if part of what's really going on here is that we need to connect with each other in a meaningful way in order to be happy and also to accept, you know, the things that are not necessarily going our way, being kind to ourselves, then if that's not something that we generally do in our culture, you know, it might be largely tied to why we're seeing such increases in stress, anxiety, depression, relationships that are falling apart, things like this, increased violence. So let's go back to the idea of happiness. And, and actually, I'm going to take it from, you know, what do the different religions say or different spiritual practices say about happiness? Now, Buddhism, you know, really focuses a lot on happiness as a central theme. And in Buddhism, there's a belief that if we were going to be truly free from suffering, you know, if we were going to have a deep sense of abiding peace, then it only comes when we overcome all sorts of forms of craving 
you know, and whether that, you know, craving is for acquiring um, wealth or uh, possessions or positions, um, that, you know, these things um, can lead to a deep sense of unhappiness you know, if we're thinking about those as cravings, like that we're constantly having to feed the beast, so to speak. And, um, you know, instead, there's a, you know, a, a, a recognition that we need to release, you know, our uh, longing for things. And, you know, instead, there's an encouragement of loving kindness and compassion and a desire for the happiness and welfare of all beings. So, you know, whether it's you and I or it's our dogs. So Buddhism, you know, as I said, focuses a lot on happiness. And, you know, it it certainly is a very ancient teaching and can help us to understand from the perspective of of a um, practice where there has been great focus on understanding of happiness and what it actually takes. Hinduism, um, you know, and particularly something called Advaita Vedanta, the ultimate goal of life is happiness, and that there is a, a sense that we have to really literally become connected with all that is in order to feel and be in a sense of uh, happiness and bliss in life. Well, I, I mean, I'm not there, so I can't say that I... Um, have achieved anything close to that. But, you know, again, these are very ancient traditions that focus on this thing of happiness. And, you know, what does that really mean when we think about, you know, happiness being something that has been addressed for, you know, as long as there's been uh, spiritual practices in religion, people have been contemplating the issue, this very tricky, confusing issue of happiness and how to get access. To it. You know, it's like we're not the only people who uh, focus on the complications of happiness. So um, in Judaism, there's a word called simcha, and that means gladness or joy. And sometimes people even use that word as a first name. And it's actually considered, you know, this thing of happiness to be a really important element in how we might serve uh, God or truth, and it's part of worship as well. Um, And, you know, giving joy to other people is seen as a uh, a kind of uh, an important goal to, you know, to do this, Um, making it your kind of mission to focus on another person's happiness as a way of giving back or, you know, in in terms of Judaism, serving God in your daily activities. So in um, Roman Catholicism, the meaning of happiness um, involves good fortune, chance, or happening, and it it actually focuses on ethics and, you know, the, the... what it takes to actually act in an ethical, in a correct manner, in a manner that is, is true. Now, the, the, um, there are a number of people within this tradition who believe that it is the man's last end toward happiness. And Thomas Aquinas says, all men agree in desiring the last end, which is happiness. So, you know, again, the focus, you know, on how important this is in our life, you know, and sometimes because life is so complicated and we have this tendency to seek happiness maybe in ways that are not necessarily kind of a true way, uh, a fully nourishing way that we will instead go running after um, things we can acquire or major accomplishments rather than the daily things that could lead to inner peace and well-being. And, you know, what would that actually take to achieve? So, you know, really, really important thing. So in, um, the, in Islam, um, there are some very famous philosophers who also focus on what is 
um, you know, really happiness today as part of their spiritual instruction and a real focus on the importance of making your life um, one in which you include the meaning of happiness in, in, a, in a true and deep way. And again, not acquiring. So that becomes really, it's, a, it's very thematic in many of the things that, that um, people who are uh, experts in happiness. So uh, Maslow's hierarchy. So Maslow was a really, really famous psychologist, and he wrote this um, kind of pyramid in which he looks at different levels of human needs, psychological and physical. And in that pyramid, you know, the top of it is self-actualization and the idea that, you know, beyond our basic human needs, like once we've got the basics dealt with, we don't have to keep on chasing more and more and better and better, but there's this deeper drive where within inside of ourselves we find this sense of peace and well-being. And, um, you know, I cannot talk about happiness without talking about Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, who, again, is a psychologist, and he talks about the concept of flow. And flow is such an interesting state because it's kind of like being in the zone. Um, you're fully immersed um, in an activity. You're very energized and focused. You've got full involvement. Now, this is a really interesting thing because with flow, you don't want to be overly challenged to the point where you're just feeling stress, and yet you have to be um, engaged enough that something is interesting and challenging um, and it's fulfilling. So, you know, th that makes it uh, a little bit of a focus. So you, you would have to make sure that if you are going to engage yourself in something that it would need to be um, very interesting but not so challenging, not so depleting that you can't be fully immersed in the activity because then that just steals from it. And that, you know, that becomes a really important um, uh, area to kind of make a, um, a reflection, you know, not too much, but enough that you're really engaged in finding that useful and meaningful. Okay, so we have a few more uh, comments. This is from Winnie. Hi, Winnie. Winnie says, I really feel that a lot of people find happiness and comfort with the materialistic things in life. Absolutely. I, I think that that's really true. Um, I find, uh, Winnie, that when people find a lot of comfort in materialistic things in life, that it can uh, start to become um, kind of difficult to really maintain because then it, it always has to be bigger and better and more expensive and fancier and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it doesn't really last very long. Um, so that's beautiful. Winnie also says, these things will eventually always let you down and leave you feeling lonely, saddened, and empty for something else. Winnie says, find the truth, help, spirituality, and faith are the winners. Wow. Thank you so much, Winnie. That is really beautiful, completely aligned with um, – what I see to be true as well. It's not unusual, I find, for people who are highly focused on materialistic things to have struggled with traumatic loneliness, which, based on my contemplation of traumatic loneliness, always includes an element of being let down or betrayed on a more social level or struggling with uh, the capacity to relate in a meaningful way with other people. So then if you believe that you, I'm not talking about you, Winnie, you, you're doing great. Um, if you believe, listeners, that you, know, you, you tend towards trying to get your happiness through acquisition of things rather than connections or deepening connections or learning how to connect with yourself or your own personal growth, then you may be struggling with your own kind of um, inner pain and suffering. That may make it difficult for you to, you know, really be with yourself and you may really want to consider what you could do to 
learn how to engage better skills in human communication, um, learn how to connect with yourself so that it doesn't, you know, feel so frightening, especially if you've had a lot of trauma or setbacks. Please work with a, a therapist, somebody who can help guide you into sitting with that in a way that will feel um, meaningful for you and safe because I have found pretty consistently that people who spend most of their energy and look we live in the material world so I'm not saying don't buy anything don't do anything to you know you know make sure that you have a home to live in and things that you need but if your focus becomes overly directed toward getting more and more and getting all of your pleasure through that then you know clearly there's something going on here that is keeping you um, focused on that rather than more broadly focused on, you know, what, what might be beneficial overall um, in your uh, growth as a person. Thank you so much, Winnie. Okay, so now we've got Sue, and Sue says, for her, thank you, Sue, meditation, faith, and believing in something, anything that is divine. Thinking beyond the now moment, thinking of others, that is what life is about. Ooh, that is really, really nice. Um, Sue, I would be very curious to hear what it is that you are thinking of when you say anything that is divine. Because I, I think you're tapping into something very profound. And it, it seems that, you know, this is where the conversation of happiness goes. It, it often goes in that direction where we, we start to realize there's so much more going on than our, you know, simple put one foot in front of the other and get through all of our tasks and buy all the stuff we need and <laughs> make lots of money or, you know, get a position or, you know, notions like that. So, Again, if you want to communicate with us, it's at instudio101 at gmail.com, and I'm always happy to hear from you. It's so interesting to get these, uh, these, these emails and to hear about what, what your version of happiness is. I want to share something with you that was sent to me, and I think it's really beautiful. It actually does come from a uh, Buddhist practice, and it really focuses on nourishing happiness. Let's see if we can all just see if we can take it in and notice what this does as we allow ourselves to um, use these words to nourish happiness. Uh, maybe it will and maybe it won't for you, but let's give it a try. And if at the end of it or during it you have an idea that pops to your head or a feeling that surfaces, let us know. All those seeds of suffering are still in me in the form of afflictions and habit energies. Mindfulness is also here helping me touch what is most wonderful within and around me. My resources for practice are my own peace and joy. I vow to cultivate and nourish them with daily mindfulness. For my ancestors, family, future generations, and the whole of humanity, I vow to practice well. I'm determined to take care of my own mental formations, to learn the art of deep listening, and using loving speech in order to communicate and understand and to be able to accept and love. Practicing the actions of a bodhisattva, I vow to look with eyes of love and a heart of understanding. I vow to listen with a clear mind and ears of compassion, bringing peace and joy into the lives of others to lighten and alleviate the suffering of living beings. 
I'm aware that ignorance and wrong perceptions can turn this world into fiery hell. I vow to walk always upon the path of transformation, producing understanding and loving kindness. I will be able to cultivate a garden of awakening. Although there are birth, sickness, old age, and death. So I wonder what what it's like to just listen to that and if you can breathe that in and recognize that that is not just for our own inner happiness, but is also about committing oneself to happiness in our, you know, larger human community and what happens to us when we make those kinds of commitments. Does it make you feel like you're on the right track? Does it make you feel like there's something important about that for you? So just some things to contemplate. I also want to talk a little bit more about the work of Sonia Lyabomorsky, who really, you know, describes happiness as the experience of joy, contentment, or positive well-being combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. And, you know, her her work is really worth taking a little while to look into. The other thing that um, Sonia um, Lyabomorsky has is a, um, a app that you can download onto your phone on happiness. Um, and she's written a few books on the same topic that are worth looking at as well. And, you know, as I said, you know, there are people who are really, um, you know, at the top of their field in this game, and, um, and she is definitely one of them. Um, her book is called The How of Happiness, The Approach to Getting the Life You Want. And because she does research, you know, she, she's not just writing a book with the idea of, you know, talking in general about happiness, but, she, you know, she bases her writing on the, you know, the, the work that she's done uh, in her lab. Uh, so the, the app is called Live Happy, and, you know, it just has a lot of different um, strategies for reinforcing this idea of the different um, ways in which you can increase that in your life if you want various practices. The other person who has done a lot of um, interesting writing and talking about happiness is Gretchen Rubin, who has written a, a very popular book that's called The Happiness Project. And she says it's all, it's all about living in the moment and appreciating the smallest things, surrounding yourself with the things that inspire you, and letting go of the obsessions that want to take over your mind. I think I have some of those obsessions. <laughs> Maybe some of you have those obsessions too. Um, not too unusual to get bogged down in, in stuff that, you know, kind of rattles our mind and pulls us in constantly when we don't even want to go there. Um, but, you know, that that's, you know, that's the piece where it's like sometimes if we fall or find ourselves slipping into old patterns or, you know, chasing down stuff that we really don't want that really isn't nourishing, you know, I really think that kindness towards ourselves is absolutely crucial because we are simply not going to change our habits and patterns through cruelty towards ourselves. It just doesn't work that way. So Gretchen Rubin also says, it is a daily struggle sometimes and hard work, but happiness begins with your own attitude and how you look at the world. So her book, The Happiness Project, or Why I Spent a Year Trying to Sing in the Morning, Clean My Closets, Fight Bright, Read Aristotle, and Generally Have More Fun. In her book, um, in Rubin's book, she lays out a plan for uh, creating happiness month by month. She gives lots of examples in her book. Um, however, I, I will just say, because uh, I mean, I've read her book and I've read some of the detractors to Rubin, who suggest that she's living a kind of privileged life that enabled her to pursue happiness using strategies allowed by her access to money and time that aren't really available to a lot of people. 
Um, but she does tackle some pretty big areas of life in her book with suggestions and strategies, and they, it might be helpful for some people. Uh, as I said, I found um, her book to be really interesting and, um, you know, worth you know, worth looking at a little bit more closely. Uh, and now I'm going to go back just for a few more minutes into uh, Lia Bomorski's work, which is, you know, pretty pretty um, significant because it really is research-based. And, you know, in her work, one of her principal questions is, why are some people happier than others? And she investigates, you know, this question. You know, and it's true. Many people have been exposed to very disturbing life events. They don't have resources. They face stress. They've experienced trauma. They've encountered terrible adversity. Um, and in um, Lia Bomorski's work, she's trying to understand, you know, you know, how is it that some people end up, you know, really just doing better uh, overall? And a lot of this, again, seems to come down to the connection with others and a recognition of focusing on really gentle things in life. Now, we're going to stop very shortly, but I do want to tell you about Be Long Tub 10, who's a monk, um, who challenges everything you might think or know about happiness, and he is truly an interesting guy. So I won't be able to uh, have you listen to his whole um, YouTube um, interview, but, you know, he he has a very useful video that I'm hoping that you will take the time to listen to. And he writes in, about this topic, but he talks in the YouTube video that's called The Secret Formula of Human Happiness. And you can find it under Gelong, G-E-L-O-N-G, Tub 10, T-H-U-B-T-E-N. And it is pretty worth taking an effort to spend some time with that very short uh, video and, and learn a little bit about, you know, the secret formula of human happiness, which is, uh, you know, the, the topic of his, his work and his book. And, you know, I want to really encourage you to look into some of these extra resources that we're going to make available to people because I want to make sure that, you know, you have some things to help you after our conversation today. Um, and I'm also hoping that you will make sure that you just spend a little bit of time contemplating on what, what your happiness really is about and whether it is you can spend some time honoring this part of yourself, contemplating what will it take to increase this inner feeling that I've been asking you to focus on today. And I have one more email, and then we will sign off. This is from Anne, and Anne says, I absolutely love this topic today. There are so many variables in life that either make us happy or sad. What we all need to do is to find that variable, and hopefully that variable will not harm us or someone, and then embrace it. Beautiful. I want to thank everybody for being so engaged today, and I want to remind you to be gentle with yourself, and maybe if you're willing, just use this month as time for your own inner experiment. We'll be posting the video and the blog and more details, links, etc., of uh, what we covered today. And I'm wishing you a gentle day. Thank you for listening to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, right here on Reality Radio 101.
Check one, two, one, two, checking one, two. One, two, one, two, checking one, two. Okay, so that's working. But why is it not working here? It's working. <laughs> 